Hi friends, welcome to Law Chat with Gerja. My name is Gerja Bhargav Patel. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I am a podcaster, I am an educator, I am a businesswoman, I am an entrepreneur, and I'm a lawyer. I truly believe in the power of mentorship through storytelling, and that's what Law Chat is all about. So whether you are in six months or 10 years of business experience, we can all learn from each other's experiences because we face the same challenges and we have the victories and we have mistakes that we're all making. So why not lean into them and know that we're going to be fine and we're going to be okay and we're going to be inspired. And of course, this is Law Chat with Gerja, so we will be talking about some law at some point during the conversation. And if you love what you hear today, which I know you will, then subscribe to Law Chat with Gerja and share the love. So grab your coffee, sparkling water or wine, and let's dive in to the next inspiring mentorship session. Hi, friends. Welcome to Law Chat. Do you ever go, ugh? when you look at someone else's Instagram feed or other types of social media feeds, or you're like, how did they create those graphics? One, it's tough to keep up with the tech trends. I know personally, it's so hard and exhausting. And second, if you're a new business, not only is it tough to figure out all the things that you need to do, but it can also be tough on your budget. And it can be exponentially raising those stress levels. So on Law Chat today, my guest, LaShonda Brown, eases those growing pains and teaches on her YouTube channel, Bootstrap Biz Advice, the how-tos of all things related to your business, from Canva to Reels to Flowdesk to email marketing. She's got you covered. She's also a Squarespace top-level designer, Flowdesk educator, and Canva certified creative. I mean, I just don't even, you're wearing so many hats. You are so uniquely equipped to help entrepreneurs in all these areas that are, in my opinion, very important because they really help with the operations and systems of the business. So I'm so honored to have you here today with us and sharing your journey with us. Welcome, LaShonda. Thank you so much for the sweet introduction. It's always so weird to hear people talk about you, but that was incredibly kind. Thank you. Of course. I mean, I I was just on, you know, I always research and I like to be somewhat, well, prepared, not somewhat, a lot prepared for all my guests that are coming on. And I was looking at, you know, watching some of your videos. I'm just like, wow, this is amazing. Where were you when I started? Because I'm just like, oh my gosh, I was literally scrapping. And then I'm like, okay, I can't. And then I'm hiring because I'm just like, I can't, I can't. And, you know, there comes a point where you're like, yes, you should outsource. Yes, you should do that. But in the beginning stages of your business, those decisions can be tough. And you are providing so much on your YouTube platform with this education that seems like you can't reach it or inaccessible at times. So I, I'm really happy to have you here and like, you know, tell that to other people also and share that with others that are trying to start their businesses and, you know, or side hustles and changing them into full time. So how did you get into this and where did you start? I mean, you were wearing lots of hats and lots of badges right now. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's interesting because this year is my 10th year being my own boss So I'm kind of going through this time of reflection on the past decade and, you know, where everything has taken me in life. And so I actually got my start as a commercial film producer. So, you know, assisting my husband with his video production company and doing script writing and finding locations and casting and working with entrepreneurs and corporations to help them tell their story with video. But in 2016, you know, some really interesting things happened online. And that was around the time that Facebook Live started to to come into its own. And people were just kind of confused about how to use video other than the traditional routes of a TV commercial or putting it on your website. And so that's when I kind of decided, you know, for five years, I had been supporting my husband's business and I felt kind of ready to start my own. And so I started a marketing company and the initial premise for it was, you know, 90 minute consultations to create 90 day strategies, which in hindsight was literally insane, but I would do it. I would sit down with someone and in 90 minutes, I would map out everything they needed to do for three months. 
And they got overwhelmed, as you might imagine. And I thought, okay, I'm excited to help people, but we got to break this thing down because they're, they're leaving these consults and they're not really knowing what next steps to take. They know what to post on social media, but they don't know how to create graphics for social media. They know they should build a list, but they don't know how to set up email marketing software. Mm -hmm. And so my YouTube channel started to support my business and to show people how to set up those systems so they could actually implement the strategy. And now I've gotten to the point where the thing that I created to support my business has now become my business. Yeah. I think that is so cool. It almost seems very organically. You were just placed in that position also to do that kind of rewinding a little bit. You know, a lot of times you, I think you also have said that you've never worked for anybody else. Yeah, I think it's a fun fact to share with people because I don't have the perspective of the comfort of a nine to five. So I've always been in a position where, you know, you're on your own. You got to figure this thing out, (laughs) you know? Yeah. And so I think that mindset allowed me to take some strategic risks, um, but it also taught me a lot of lessons that I'm trying to look back and teach other people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's so important that you say that because the thing is that when we're starting out something new, especially if we've never worked in that field in a corporate or more structured environment, that you're like, you gain the, the structure and the basic idea of the flow maybe sometimes. So how do you develop that for yourself? And how do you pick yourself up from the mistakes that you make? I'm pretty sure you've made mistakes along the way. Oh, certainly. <laughs> and when someone's like, oh, well, this is not how you do it. This is how we do it. How do you overcome that? Or how do you figure it out? Yeah, I think in terms of mindset for mistakes, I, I tell people all the time, you're going to make mistakes, but the issue is how quickly do you get back up after you've made them? There are some people who fall down and hop up so quickly. You don't even realize that they made a mistake, but there are other people that make a mistake and they lay on the ground and they make snow angels and they like draw all this attention to themselves and they make it worse for themselves wallowing in the self-pity because they realize that they weren't perfect and you're just not you're not perfect. <laughs> like You just have to release yourself from that mentality that you have to navigate through this journey without making missteps because it, the messy middle of learning these things is how you're going to grow. And those lessons stick in your head a lot better than when you got it right the first time. So I think one of the gifts that I have is I'm really not afraid of mistakes because I've noticed that because I do so much, people they miss the mistakes Mm -hmm. because I move fast enough. And so I think that's the thing is just stay agile and just keep moving. You learn from it, but you don't let it paralyze you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I love the imagery of creating snow angels and asking for attention. (laughs) I think that's so funny. And, And it's easy to, it's easy to succumb to that. It's easy because I mean, I'm in the middle of something right now and I'm just like, gosh, I expected X, Y, Z results. What's going on? And then, you know, reminding yourself that whatever pep talk you need to give yourself, you know, to keep moving forward is the key is to keep moving forward is to keep showing up. And I mean, you know, even with your business, you are pretty much, you created your own path. Did you ever come across anybody saying to you, like how I mentioned earlier, like, well, this is how we do it in, you know, video marketing, or this is how we do it. And basically telling you, you need to do this and you're doing it the wrong way. You know, there are times when you're like, yes, I agree. Okay. Let me figure this out. But that can also be daunting. And so how did you have those moments? And what did you do to be say like, okay, see you later. I'm going to do this this way. Yeah, I posted about this on Instagram a couple of days ago and I said, don't let their advice cloud your judgment or drown out your intuition. And I think it's really important with all of these experts. I say that with air quotes for the those of you listening, <laughs> the <laughs> experts telling you what you need to do to be successful. Because the reality is there's so many different types of businesses who have so many different origin stories and no one followed the exact same model to get to where they are. Some of people, you know, they were in the right place at the right time. Some 
because of generational wealth, we're able to leverage off of someone else's income to, to catapult their, their business faster or whatever. Everyone has a different story. And so I think what's so vital is when you start your journey as an entrepreneur, you have to slow down long enough to understand what your values are. And when you start to hear advice from other people, filter their advice through your values. Because say for instance, for me, I'm adamant about not giving advice that will make someone have to jeopardize their livelihood to actually implement it. You know, there's tons of people who'll say, oh, you want to have a successful course launch? Then what you need to do is you need to do a webinar. And then to get people in the webinar, you need to spend 10 grand on Facebook ads. And so once you get thousands of people in the webinar and then hundreds will show up and then tens of them will pay. And then that's how you have a five-figure launch. And I'm like, okay, cool. But my values say, I want to be a good steward over my money. Giving my money to Facebook is not a good steward of my money. So why don't I just have a better relationship with serving my audience? So when I'm doing something, I can just send an email and convert much higher than that with much less effort. And so these tactics might work for some people, but if they don't work with your values, if they're not in alignment with how you want to do things, then you'll find yourself trapped in a business that you don't want to work for. And so you have to fight. You have to fight to filter the advice because if you don't, eventually you're not even going to recognize yourself or recognize mm-hmm. your business. Mm-hmm. So you just have to be resilient with that. Gosh, that is such good advice. Such good advice because a lot of times we get so inspired even by somebody else and get inspired with the way they're doing things that we unknowingly will start mimicking them. But the reality right. is that we're not staying true to who we are. I hate using the word authentic all the time because it's so overused, but the truly is that like deep down who you are, you need to stay in line with that because that's what really resonates. That's your gift. And that gift is what shines out of you when you're staying true to yourself. I and it keeps your myself. business from being draining too. I think people, yeah. when, when you start getting caught up in the rat race of implementing someone else's ideas for your life, you, you will find yourself exhausted. Yes. You know? And so it's just easier. It's more freeing to say, I have taken the time to figure out who I am and what I stand for. And I'm going to keep searching until I find my people. And then that's what I'm going to implement. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you're right, because the joy, it should be joyful during your right. business, especially if you're an entrepreneur, it should be joyful because you really have a lot of the control in your hands on how things are functioning and the flow of everything as well. And it's so true that because I personally don't like webinars, I've gone to a couple of them and there's very like maybe two that I've really thoroughly enjoyed where I'm like, oh, wow, I've actually received something out of this and not just a big marketing spam that's coming my way. So I've just been so jaded by them that I personally don't like to do them either. I don't find value. And because I don't like it, it's hard for me to sit there and do it. Not that I won't do it in the future, because now I know that the difference between what I do like in one and what I don't like in one and how I need to make my webinar look as opposed to the ones I don't like. And that's okay too. It's okay to take something and transform it in a way that suits you and fits you well as well. Yeah. And I think for me, it's, you have to be willing to experiment. You know, I think there's kind of this mindset that you need to like, know how everything's going to work out and be able to project everything and everything's by the book. And no, I mean, you're, you're dealing with serving real people with real problems. And so you've got to be willing to do things and see how they respond, Mm -hmm. you know? And so for me, my personal issue with the webinar format for selling is I don't like to sell. I like to serve. And so with webinars, I feel like the whole model is all Mm -hmm. about sell, sell, sell metrics, metrics, metrics. And it feels like the webinar itself becomes a launch in and of itself. It's like, you're launching a product, but you have to launch the webinar to launch the product. And I'm like, my word, this is exhausting. Why am I doing this song and dance just to get people to buy my product? Shouldn't the product be so good that they can make that decision for themselves? And so, you know, I just kept experimenting with different formats. And I really found that YouTube was phenomenal because 
It allowed me to create a library of content that showed I was a subject matter expert, that showed I was a thought leader, and people could stumble across it three months from now and still hire me based on a video I did. Versus a webinar, it's like if you're not in the room at that moment, then I can't capture your info or I can't get the sale. And so it's it's a way more laid back approach to growing a business that fits my personality well. I cannot stand hard selling. Like it just, Mm -hmm. it feels like manipulation to me and I Mm -hmm. just, I can't get down with it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, it's not in alignment, but for other people, they love that format. And so really just figuring out like, what's the business that you want to be known for? What do you want your legacy to be? Not what somebody else is doing, but what is it that you want for your future? And then craft that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I hate to interrupt this awesome conversation, but I have to stop and talk with you about the number one thing I'm asked about by entrepreneurs, contracts. They're vital to any business relationship and to protect your business. But I also know that entrepreneurs, especially when you're starting up, money is tight, but I would never want you to compromise on a strong legal foundation. So enter your contractbuddy.com, a website created by me with contract templates created and drafted by me and fellow industry partners. They're ready to use and easy to plug in immediately. And they are not restricted to any specific state. So yourcontractbuddy.com is sponsoring this episode and you and your listener can get 10% off right now with code LAWCHAT. Yes, you heard me right. 10% off right now with code LAWCHAT. And now back to our awesome conversation. Gosh, I'm literally soaking in everything you just said. I'm just like, oh, yes, I agree. I agree. I agree. And you're right. I'm on the same wavelength as you with regards to marketing It's tough, but as an entrepreneur, you have to wear that hat also because you are your biggest cheerleader, your biggest supporter in the sense of going out and being the face of your company. So having the ease to market needs to be there, but now the way you do it is something you can craft for yourself. I think YouTube is a great avenue and medium. And how did you, I know you kind of briefly spoke about it earlier, but getting into the YouTube world, how did you really start? figuring that out and like saying, this is it. Like, what are some of your tricks for you two or tips? Yeah. So I think I began to realize, you know, step one, that YouTube was such an incredible platform in the sense that it compensated its creators. You know, when I post on Instagram, I don't make a dime unless Mm -hmm. I'm driving traffic to something of my own. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. Instagram does not write me a check. Right. YouTube writes me a check on a monthly basis. And so what I loved about that was like, wow, even if the person watching this doesn't go to my website, if all they do is play this video, I'm making money. I'm making money every time I post. And that mindset really encouraged me to create. And so it really just started with, okay, I've got to get my subscribers up and I've got to get my watch hours up so I can join the YouTube partner program. So if nothing else, YouTube will compensate me for creating this free content. And then it started to evolve into other streams of income based on using YouTube as that engine to drive traffic. And now it's to the point where I've completely replaced my salary from client work with YouTube related income. And so moving into this new season, this next decade, if you will, where I can educate for free as a job. (laughs) It's just like, what, (laughs) what is this world? And I don't have a huge channel and, and most people don't know who I am. And sometimes all I'm doing is sharing my screen, but there's a place for me on YouTube. And so I think it's, it's such a beautiful place to be in, to find that platform that really does fit your style of educating or serving and just go in deep on that platform. And you'll see so much more results going deep on a platform than spreading yourself wide over tons of different outlets. Mm-hmm. Oh gosh. And can we talk a little bit about the partnership program with YouTube? I don't think mm-hmm. many people may not even know about it, but how, two part question. One, how do you gain that traction to get the minimum subscribers for to be even eligible for this partnership? And how do you get into this partnership program? 
Yeah. So what the partnership program says, you know, as of the time of this recording, because you always change things, <laughs> is you need a thousand subscribers and 4,000 watch hours within a 12 month span of time. And so in my opinion, the easiest thing to do is to get the subscribers and then to shift your focus to the watch hours. And the biggest mistake that I see people making is they create a YouTube channel and they tell their friends and family, hey guys, can you go subscribe to my YouTube channel? And you see this happen on a lot of different social media platforms. And the reason why it's not a good thing to do is because you want to build your following with people who are going to keep coming back and watch content. Because if they subscribe and they never actually watch your content, it's telling YouTube, this is not the content your subscribers want to see and it hurts you in the algorithm. So if you have a pre-existing audience, whether it's an email list or a Facebook group or an Instagram account, people who have already resonated with your message somewhere else, those are the people that you need to say, hey guys, there's more value on this platform where I can actually go into detail versus Instagram, you know, which is one post. And there's so little I can say with that, but mm -hmm. I can say a lot more on YouTube. Why don't you go subscribe there? And so get those subscribers up and then focus on, you know, that watch time. How can I create content that's bingeable? You know, that same person that's watching video after video after video, or they're constantly coming back. And so once you hit those metrics, then you're just in. And so when advertisers put ads on your videos, they pay YouTube and then YouTube gives you a cut of that money. And so that's how that works. So, you know, you start to look at ads in a completely different way once you have a monetized channel, because you're like, oh my gosh, please yeah. just get the ad, let it play. <laughs> like if that's you like genius. it, click on it. All of this you know? is genius. How to monetize YouTube. Yeah. That's like, all of this is genius. And I think a lot of us, I mean, I'm not leveraging it that way for sure. And I have so much on YouTube also, like so much content. You know, these are my questions. Like, how do you do that? So. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, honestly, even here's the thing. I think it's so funny how we have different perceptions about money, depending on the situation. You know, if, if you said, okay, if I gave you, you know, a $5 bill every week, just because no reason, just mm -hmm. here's five bucks. You'd be like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I'm going to get a free cup of coffee. I'm going to whatever. But for some people when, you know, they're only making pennies on YouTube, they're like, oh, it's not worth it. You know, I'm only making $5 a week. Oh, I'm only making, but I'm telling you, like I started making pennies a day. And as you continue to show up, as you continue to be consistent, it's to the point where I'm making thousands a month, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it takes time because mm -hmm. you've got to build that library of content. You've got to build, build up your subscribers and your, your mm -hmm. watch hours. So yeah, you're going to be putting in time where you're not seeing that return, but if you're doing it on the back end while you're doing everything else, you know, just being faithful over there, eventually it will develop into something that's going to generate some passive income for your business. Right. That's so wonderful. And it's such a, you know, it's such a great, I don't want to call it a hack, but almost seems like a, a hack in the sense of just, you keep doing what you're doing. YouTube will take care of it. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, the, the real game changer was the application tube buddy like YouTube tube buddy. Mm -hmm. And what that did is it allowed me to start doing SEO for my videos, just like you would do SEO for a website. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you what that did to my channel and it's a free tool, it's insane. Like you can, you can upgrade it to like a premium level, but you can use tube buddy for free. And I began to see a huge spike and the people watching my content. And then I looked at my analytics and I noticed that the majority of the people watching my videos were not subscribers. They were finding me in a YouTube search or Google search. Mm -hmm. And it was because of this tool helping me to optimize my content. Mm -hmm. So even if that's something that you're not that familiar with, or it feels overwhelming, there are literal apps that you just plug in the information and it, it gives you the answer. So to me, there's this stigma that YouTube is so hard. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's because it's a video-based platform. But now what I love is over on Instagram, now you people have become, you know, cinematographers. <laughs> You're doing wardrobe changes. You are lip syncing. You are, you've become dancers and all this mm-hmm. stuff. And I'm like, mm-hmm. if you can make a reel, you can make a YouTube video. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> like the I'm expectation like, I, so much lower over there. I, I actually prefer doing YouTube over a reel. Like <laughs> throw it out there. Yeah, so Instagram reels, are, reels like, are a whole nother production, in, in my opinion. And it takes time. It's not like a five minute situation. It's a, a, a legit 30 to 45 minutes, if not longer situation. I'm just like, oh my gosh, I cannot even. Because for me, I'm like, God, I'm taking away time from what I really love to do, which is legal work and serving my clients. And so I, I'm just like, I can't, I cannot take away like time from doing that. Anyways, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> We'll have to do another podcast episode <laughs> about Instagram marketing because that's a whole other <laughs> situation. But yeah, Instagram. But if anything, when you look at Instagram, when you look at Facebook or when you look at YouTube, videos are the thing. Videos yeah. is where they're focusing now. Videos is where the algorithms are also preferring over other, you know, still pictures. And it's interesting. It's interesting because everybody you know, for marketing purposes, if you want to get somewhere on one of these platforms, you got to put a video in, right? And it can be tough. It can be so tough. So what are some, I mean, I feel like you're like a real expert on this right now. And so <laughs> what, are, <laughs> what are some of your tips for someone who is a newbie on, on videos and how do you overcome that fear? And then also maybe even the like, oh, I don't want to do this. Yeah. So I I think the biggest thing that would encourage a new YouTuber is to know that when I started on YouTube, I didn't even show my face. I was so uncomfortable being on camera, even though my background is video production. You know, I liked being behind the camera and coaching people and interviewing people. I really didn't want to be in the forefront. I didn't want to have to do my makeup and, and all these different things. And so I just made videos where I would record my screen and I would talk while I was clicking around. And that was the video. Mm -hmm. And so when you really think about it, there's not that much to that. You know, if you can do a Zoom call, you can literally record a Zoom call and turn it into a YouTube video. So this idea that you've got to do this, you know, overwhelming production is just not true. It's really focusing on quality content. And if you're teaching someone in a very clear and concise way, how to do something, they'll watch it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But when you do feel that sense of confidence that you can be on camera, it will perform higher. If you show your face, people like to connect face to face. And so ultimately the end goal is to get to the point where you feel comfortable And I recommend that if someone's trying to overcome that camera shyness, they feel uncomfortable on camera is honestly use another platform to work on the skill when fewer people are watching. So whether it's, you know, within a small Facebook group with your friends and say, I'm going to go live in that Facebook group and I'm going to keep showing up until I feel comfortable and then transitioning to YouTube. Or I'm going to use Instagram live and I'm not even going to save the broadcast. So whoever pops on live will see me practicing, but I just want to get more comfortable talking on camera. Mm -hmm. And so just do those small things to help you become more comfortable in your own skin and then, you know, branch out from there, but you don't have to start there. Yeah. Really. You just need to start with putting out quality content and then add more production value as you go along. That, and that's such a good advice because, you know, sometimes we'll see YouTube or even on Instagram, we'll see people that we follow that are pretty big in their, you know, following and all that stuff. And their production is like very, very sophisticated. And then you're like, gosh, I need to have that. But the reality is no, you just need to put something out there and put something out there that just like you said, it's quality is something that people are actually gaining value from. Well, and I will tell you a lot of these celebrities, because I have friends that are professional TikTokers, like that's their job. Like they will pay TikTokers to make their content for their TikTok or their Instagram. And I'm just at the point now where I'm like, I'm not at the level where I feel comfortable paying for content I'm putting out on a free platform. Like 
just like entertaining content. You know what I mean? Like I, again, like I like bootstrapping. I really like being a good steward of money. And I'm like, is it a good use of my money to either invest my time because my time is worth a lot of money Mm -hmm. or to literally pay someone to help me just to entertain some people on my Instagram account. And what I noticed polling my audience on Instagram is they actually prefer to learn from me than to be entertained by me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, thank goodness, because that's a lot easier for me to do. Well, that's a great question. That's a great poll question. What do you, what kind of videos do you prefer from me? Educating or my behind the scenes or my, you know, my fun entertaining videos. And that's a great question to get and to pull on your Instagram account. I think that's so smart. Maybe also like, do you think that they're obviously maybe getting money from ads and from sponsors then like that's maybe their ultimate goal might be for the ones that are looking out to like professional TikTokers or, you know, paying to get their content out, but maybe it's also because they might be actually now leveraging passive income through advertisements. Or yeah. I mean, influencer marketing is huge. I mean, you could definitely be in a position and I, I have friends who, you know, have half a million on YouTube and have, you know, a uh, hundred thousand on Instagram and they're paid to hold products in their hands and things like that. I honestly, I'm not to that point yet. Yeah. Um, I have gotten to the point where I get free stuff. Um, but I'm not charging on other platforms. I have sponsors on YouTube, but not other platforms yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that kind of makes sense to me. If you pay for a professional photographer to take photos of you with sponsored items. Okay. That makes sense. But if you're saying, okay, when I go on family vacation, I've got to hire a photographer so that I can get drone footage and I can get gorgeous photos of my family at that point we've kind of lost sight yes. of, what, of what we're actually trying to accomplish. <laughs> Cause it's like, okay, if you're a lawyer, then, then why, why do we have drone footage of your family vacation? I don't know how that relates. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I completely agree with you. And on a personal level, I really don't share much of my personal life on Instagram. I'm, I'm just like, there is, it's my personal life. And that's also my kids. And I just kind of like keep that on the side a little bit. Here and there, I'll share like cultural things so people can get um, information about my culture, my heritage, and, you know, kind of in educate in that aspect, but in a way where it's like, oh, this is what's happening in my life. But I agree. And even with sponsorships, I, I really wonder, I don't know if I'd sponsor, like if I do a makeup thing, like, I don't think I would do that because that's just not me. And then also what am I selling on my platform? Like, what am I educating about? What's the value that I'm bringing? And that's not it. And so that's not aligned with what my values are. Not that I don't like makeup, but like, you know, (laughs) like just for what my mission for my business is more than anything else. I I used to share so much amazing information about YouTube and everything else in there. And I really wanted to just kind of rewind a little bit and ask you about what are some big challenges that you faced in your business or even in your personal life that have really influenced where you are today? I mean, like, how did you overcome them and be where you are today also? Yeah, I mean, everyone's background is different, but I am a recovering workaholic. Like, I definitely for years and years and years, put my self-worth and what I could produce. And so if I ever got sick or if I ever did something slower than I expected it should take, I was so hard on myself. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me in this season, really understanding that balance of it's important to work and to put out valuable information to serve your community but you also have to take care of yourself. You can't run yourself into the ground and expect to be able to show up well for your people. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, because I have, I'm an Enneagram too. So I am like no wings. I'm a two through and through. I will serve until my eyes pop out. And so because (laughs) of that, you know, I'm always giving and going and whatever you need. And that's beautiful. However, you know, I have to have that same compassion for myself that I do for other people. And so it's like, okay, how am I pouring into myself so that I have the capacity to pour out into other people? And so I had to crash and burn multiple times, you know, working 14, 16 hour days, working weekends, never taking vacations and all this stuff 
to get to the point where I realized, okay, this is not working well. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, I'm emotionally eating and my face is breaking out and I'm irritable all the time. And all these, am I really serving my audience well at that point? Or am I, am I doing the most because I feel guilty about having balance in my life? And so just doing a lot of self-work to say, you know what? No, it's okay to not work on the weekend. Yeah. It's okay to stop at five o'clock. You know, those different things in my life have actually allowed me to show up in a better way. The quality of my content, my demeanor is so different. I used to be so uptight. Now I'm like, Lucy goosey, whatever. It's fine. Like, it's just so funny. I feel like a little hippie, but truly (laughs) it's like what I'm doing. I have so much joy because I'm not burnt out. Yeah. And I thought I needed a career change and I just needed a mindset change. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people are in the situation, especially given where we are in this time in the world, your burnout is really clouding your judgment about how good your situation actually is. Mm -hmm. You're so tired. You can't be grateful. (laughs) All you can do is just complain because it's so much. But if you just take that time to just nurse yourself back to health and just take a deep breath and say, you know what? this is a privilege. This is awesome that I get to work for myself. This is so cool. I get to choose who I work with and where I work and how I work. Mm -hmm. If you can get back to that point, then you can really start to soar in your business. But if you're so burnt out, you can't think straight. You're not serving anybody well at that point. Oh gosh, such so much wisdom right there. And I think it kind of goes back into what you were saying earlier also is if it's not aligned with your business, you're going to feel the burnout also because you're chasing after something that doesn't even resonate with you. So it's hard to even grasp it because your grasp is not made for that. And so it's just like, same thing. It's, you know, learning to rest, learning when to say no, learning when something doesn't fit for you. And it's a process. It's not something that happens overnight. I I personally like to put rest into my schedule now. (laughs) Oh, that's beautiful. Because it's, um, it's same thing, right? Like if we don't do it, then I've, I notice when I'm not doing it the right way or the way that really works for me, I turn into some like crazy banshee or something. So it's just, (laughs) It's not a a good look. Nobody wants that. (laughs) Nobody wants that, especially me. (laughs) Well, and I think we notice, we notice when we're just so irritable and every little thing just sets us off. And it's just like, when you get to that point, the only thing that you can do to recover is just to step away. Yeah. And it's hard, but it's, it's needed. It's really needed. Yeah. Well, this is wonderful. I love that. So it's one of my questions I love asking every single guest of mine is we all face challenges. Like we were just talking, it can be mental, physical, you know, whatever. What is your anchor? What is the thing that holds you steady? Jesus. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I love the Lord. And, and that's definitely woven into everything that I do. And I think, I think for me, everyone has different perspectives on what that takes in their life. But I, I want to be known for who I love and how I love. And so because I lead everything with love, I think it really does ground me. Like I'm not doing this for people to think I'm impressive. I'm not doing this to become famous. Making tutorials is not the path to Hollywood. Like it's just (laughs) not, it's not the road, you know, (laughs) but I, I genuinely love what I do because when people are equipped and empowered to do their job well, from that point, so many amazing things can happen. And so it's like, okay, yeah, maybe I'm making a little tutorial about how to make this in Canva, but the magnitude of how to make a brochure that becomes the collateral that helps a foster child find their parent. It's like, oh my gosh, Mm. that tutorial changed this kid's life. That's what you're doing. It's Mm -hmm. not about the work. It's about the impact, you know? And so Mm -hmm. like when I, when I slow down long enough to think about that part, it just, it really does anchor me. And it gives me that sense of 
purpose that something that I'm doing that seems mundane to most is really my mission. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, so beautifully explained. That is just so beautiful is to really go back to your impact, the mission that you have that's leading to that impact. Sometimes we lose sight of that too. So beautifully shared. I love that. So what is it that today you are, of course, on YouTube and you share tons of tutorials on YouTube. How are some other ways you're serving your clients? And I mean, do you take on clients? What, what does your business do today? Yeah. So I, I now have a word for, or a term for it. And this has come after weeks and weeks of going like, okay, you want to be a YouTuber, but your journey looks so different from what most people are doing on YouTube. So is that even the right term for you? Or, you know, we kind of have this business card mentality of like, I need a label to put on myself. So people understand what I do and and what's my label going to be. And honestly, I want to be labeled as someone who is radical with her generosity to the point where you're just like that. It doesn't make sense that that was free. Like it doesn't make sense that there's no like opt-in or ulterior motive. Like what is that about? And the reason why I'm able to do that is because my client truthfully is the tech companies. It's not my students. You know, these tech companies create amazing software, but if people don't know how to use it or if they don't know it exists, then they're not actually able to serve that community well. And so I kind of stand in this gap between the end user and these tech companies, understanding how the entrepreneur thinks, but also understanding tech well enough to interpret for them. And so the tech companies, the YouTubes, the Canvas, the Flowdesk, the Jotform, those are the people keeping my lights on. And so because that's my business, then the students are able to receive all of this free information without having to worry about what's LaShonda going to pitch to me next because mm. there's no next, you know, there's, I think I'm, there's I think no I might, yeah. yeah, I think I might create a Patreon at some point because some people do, you know, with the whole idea of reciprocity, people want to give back if you've given so much to them and I don't really have a, a product for them right now. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think I will evolve to that point, but again, I think that mindset of like, I can watch this tutorial and I don't have to worry about midway through, she's going to sell me on some nine 99 course, you know, that this was just a lead magnet to get to this step, to funnel you here (laughs) and to upsell you there. No, I just want you to learn. <laughs> like, I just want you to learn. Uh, and, and I love that these tech companies love the way that I show up for my audience and mm-hmm. everyone wins, everyone wins. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. if you can find that sweet spot, then that's the lane you need to drive in. Yeah. And for you, fortunately, you don't have to do that with your clients because your audience is not your client. And so you, you're it definitely in that, you know, different space. So for listeners who are in, in the space where they, your clients are your audience, I mean, it's okay to have those techniques as part of your, you know, marketing, but do it in a way that is really aligned with who you are and aligned with your mission also of your business. Because again, like how we've been talking, if it's not, it's going to definitely cause friction. And that friction is going to be either the demise of your business or of your health. And so you have to figure that one out. (laughs) And I will say, I mean, obviously I'm very excited about the career path that I'm in, but if you're in a position where you are a service provider or even a product-based business, and your marketing materials are funneling people to make a buying decision, there's nothing wrong with that. However, you want to present all of your marketing with the mindset of, I want the customer to make the decision for themselves that this is what they want. If your marketing is such a hard sell that it's almost like manipulation to get people to buy, then it's not sustainable. But if you have the mindset, I love people who are 
like hand letterers where they will, they'll show the behind the scenes of them making a product or they'll show themselves packing a product or even a boutique. They'll model the inventory and then you decide when you see that top or those pants or those shoes, I want that. And then you take action and go buy it. All they have to do is make you aware of what exists and then you buy what fits you. It's not that they're trying to make you feel like you're less than a person and that your life will be changed if you buy this top. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like there's a difference, you know? And so I think out of desperation, sometimes people resort to these marketing strategies where everything's a flash sale or everything's a coupon or, you know, everything is, you know, look at these testimonials and and don't you want a life like this? And no, no, no. Market in such a way where you empower your customers to make the decision for themselves. Because when you do that, they'll buy from you, they'll refer you, and they'll keep coming back. And ultimately you make more money that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. I mean, seriously, love it. <laughs> I'm like, you don't, you just don't have to be skeezy about it. You know, I just feel like truly like some people are just slimy and skeezy about it. <laughs> and it's like, you're not ultimately helping yourself in the long run. You're not building, yeah. you're not building a brand where your customers become your brand ambassadors. You know, you need to create a product and provide a service that's so freaking good that people feel compelled to tell their friends about it unsolicited. Mm -hmm. And if your business isn't to that point, then you need to spend the time working on your business to make it brag worthy. So people do it for you. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I don't know how many mic drops we just had, but that was (laughs) excellent. (laughs) See, that's the thing. What I love about my job is I I can just say what I think. I'm like, man, love, love, love. I mean, amazing. Well, but I do want to ask about some legal challenges. If you've ever had any or any legal, you know, personal in your business where you're like, oh, I should have done that. Or I did it. And I was, that was the best thing I ever did for my business. Yeah. I mean, I think when you start your business, you just, you just want to have a lawyer in your back pocket. You know, you don't have to be navigating a lawsuit to need a lawyer. Like there's so many questions. There's so many contracts that you really should have somebody to look at before you sign them. There's so many clauses you should have in your agreements that, you know, having a lawyer in your arsenal of professionals that you pay, even when you're bootstrapping is so vital because you're going to make mistakes. You're just, you're going to do it. And so you don't want to make ones that, you know, are illegal. <laughs> you know, those, those are not the types of mistakes that we want to do. You know, if you choose the wrong brand colors, okay, fine. You can change those, but you know, you want to make sure that everything you do is on the up and up. So I would say, even if you are building from the ground up, you know, you don't have a ton of money to invest in a lot of different areas. That's not something I would cut. Hmm. And I would just, you know, I've got stories upon stories from other clients. And I'm like, man, if you had just had someone to advise you, yeah, you could have saved so much more money being advised yeah. than having to pay the penalties. So yeah. just have I'm, a all, I'm all about the upfront mitigation. You know, the upfront costs are so much less than the later on frantic I'm in a bind cost. So I completely agree with you. Well, I know that you are actually, there's something out there that the listeners and the viewers can actually get from you right now. You have some amazing, again, you know, resources out there. So what is the one thing that you have just recently pushed out into the world? Yeah, I decided to start telling people how I make money on YouTube because I am so intrigued by this world. I'm like, more people really need to know mm-hmm. that you can generate passive income using this social media tool. Mm-hmm. So my, my freebie that I send a lot of people to is my YouTube passive income guide. And it is a 16 page guide that I created answering questions that people asked me, you know, things about overcoming camera shyness and what equipment should I buy and what should I make videos about and how often should I post? All that stuff is in there. So if you are at all interested in pursuing YouTube, not necessarily as your business, but as Mm -hmm. something to generate passive income and generate leads for yourself, I would check it out. So that's, that's the thing that I'm most excited about right now in terms of my free resources, because 
you could read something for free and make money off it, which I just think is great. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I'm going to get it because I think it's just like amazing. I'm on YouTube and I'm just like, okay, clearly I'm not taking advantage of anything right now either. Um, again, it's just because I'm just like, push out, push out the content, push out the information, push out the value and hopefully somebody will grab it. So it's been so lovely talking to you today. I have, I think I just needed you in my life right now as well. And so <laughs> it was so wonderful speaking to you. Um, before we, you know, say bye, uh, what is one of your favorite books, whether it's personal or educational, anything? Oh man, I'm trying to think of something I read recently that I really, okay, 12 week year. I love that book. I'm all about how can I manage my time better? And the basic premise, I'm not going to ruin it for you, but the basic premise of the book is we often push really hard fourth quarter to finish strong. But what if you could simulate that in your business instead of just one time a year, four times a year? And so you work for 12 weeks and then you take a week off to reflect to regroup and to plan for the next 12 weeks. And that mindset has helped so many corporations mm -hmm. to just skyrocket their sales because they're not trying to think at the beginning of the year what they're needing to do for 12 months. They're only focused on 12 weeks. And it just, it just changed the way I approach business. I, I don't try to tackle as much at one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realize that by thinking about things in this way, I'm actually able to get more done. So 12 week year is probably one of my favorite books right now. Love it. It's on my list. <laughs> yeah, definitely check it out. It's so good. Awesome. So good. And how can we connect with you? So you can go to LaShondaBrown.com and find everything. But of course, find me on YouTube, Bootstrap Biz Advice. And if you want to just be a part of my life, all the random things that I experience and random thoughts I want to share, then you can follow me on Instagram at LaShonda M. Brown. Okay. All of this stuff will be on the show notes as well. And before we say bye, what was that quote that was on your Instagram last week? I thought it was just so powerful what you had shared with us earlier in this um, interview. Oh, was it the quote about um, your judgment? That quote? Yeah. Okay. Don't let their advice cloud your judgment or drown out your intuition. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, I am so happy to end this conversation on that note because it is so much to think about. And you have just, again, given so many different mic drops. Like I'm just gonna have to gather them all together now. <laughs> Well, well, and that's wow. one of the, that's one of the posts on my Instagram is just really showing people how to repurpose content. And I think sometimes when you talk things out loud, you, you say a lot more profound things than if you just sat down to write. So, yeah. you know, transcribe, yeah. transcribe your Instagram lives, your, your interviews your whatever, because it's going to help you to create content more easily to just pull from things that were said out loud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gosh, so true. So true. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. You shared such great advice, so much wisdom and insight. As always, thank you. You're so welcome. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining Law Chat with Gerja. I just love these kind of conversations, conversations that are motivating, inspiring, the truthful, raw, and honest about all of the challenges, all of the victories, all of the triumphs, picking ourselves back up again. I just can't think of a better way to get mentorship but Law Chat with Gerja. If this was helpful to you or this was inspiring to you, please share the love. You can give this video a thumbs up. You can subscribe to this channel. You can also share this with your community by taking a screenshot and posting it on your social media and tagging GBP Law. When you do that, a lot more people will be able to see this video that not only benefited you, but also can benefit them as well. So let's share that love and let's share that inspiration. And if you want more information about what I do and other resources, go check out gbplaw.com or yourcontractbuddy.com. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Mm -hmm.